kind of skip around on a hymn or do something like that, understand it's not my mind that is going, it's just my eyes. My mind is quickly following it, but it is just the eyes. It's It's contagious, yes. It is contagious, and it, I think it has something to do with that thing called age, but uh, which I'm in denial about, so I guess we'll just have to keep hoping that denial keeps going. The, traf- or the message today is human trafficking and Amy Carmichael. And I will suspect that for many of you, the name Amy Carmichael does not ring any bells. Uh, I know I had never heard of her before last year. But I think once I heard her story, I knew it was one that I wanted to share. But before we get into her story, I want to read some scriptures that are very applicable to her story and, I think, to us. We're going to start in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. It says, When the Son of Man comes into His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious thorn. And before him will be gathered all the nations, and they will be separated people from one another as shepherds separate the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you, for the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or be naked and clothe you? And when you... Excuse me. And when they did, we see you sick and in prison and visit you. And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, As you did it to one of the least of these, my brother, you did it to me. Verse 41 says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked, or sick or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And those will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Those scriptures are very poignant. Because it suggests to me that while I am not going to get into the works versus grace part of salvation, it is an integral part of our salvation that we are called to minister to one another. You will not be saved by those works, but those works will certainly evidence that you are saved. And if you are not producing works, then it is very probable that you are not saved. Salvation comes from God as a free gift, but it manifests itself in a love that God shared to us that we share to another. And like I said, the name Amy Carmichael probably doesn't ring too many bells. And prior to last year, I had never heard of it. But when I heard her story... I was both moved and amazed at what some one woman was able to do. She was born in 1867. Her father ran a mill in Ireland. And frankly, the mill workers were poor and starving people. And she took pity on those mill workers and started a ministry even as a young girl. And that led to other ministries where she went to both China and to uh, Belfast. She literally was all over the world. And she ended up in India about the turn of the century. While she was there with a fellowship from her church, she was met by a young girl named Prina. The girl was seven years old. And 
when Prina came up to her, she grasped onto her and clung to her and says, please don't send me back. What the case was is in India during this time, and frankly up until the 1950s, it was legal to sell your children to the Hindu temple as temple prostitutes. And this seven-year-old girl had been sold by her family as a temple prostitute. She had escaped and went back to her family, and her family promptly took her back to the Hindu temple. So she knew enough the next time around to not go back home. And she went to Amy Carmichael hoping that maybe she could do it. Now Amy Carmichael was a young lady who frankly had never heard of such things. And I'll be honest with you, I wish I had never heard of such things. But she said, okay, I'm going to give you sanctuary. And the priest from the Hindu temple came and demanded that they return this girl. And when Amy refused, they went to the Indian government. And the Indian government said, you must give her back. And Amy said, no. When that failed, the Indian government went to the ministerial uh, missions board of the one that she served and demanded that they tell her to give that girl back. And sadly, that mission board came to Amy and says, give her back, which Amy said no. Now that should tell you quite a bit about the society that she was in. And in 1901, she decided to move out on her own, separate from her own mission board, and create what's called the Donover Fellowship. That was founded in 1901 and is still being run in India today. It services people like Prina who were captured into the trade. And frankly, if you've heard me talk about Wings of Refuge, one of the things I will tell you is that human trafficking is one of those things that everyone has heard about and everyone kind of knows exists, but they don't know much. And it, honestly, if they would prefer, they would like to know that there's not any more of that, you know. It's, it's over there in India. It's in New York City. It's in LA. It's not in Marshalltown, Iowa. And the sad truth is it's in Marshalltown, Iowa. And I'd love to tell you that seven-year-olds aren't being sold into prostitution. But I can tell you that in this day and age, today in 2022, you can go to Thailand and buy an infant for sex. It's legal. It's acceptable. There are more people enslaved today than was ever in the past, and that includes the transatlantic slave trade that we know so much about today. The slave trade today is so much greater and bigger than it was then. It's difficult to look at those numbers and look at that reality and not become just a little bit angry. Not want to do something. And I would love to tell you that it's going to get better. But the truth of it is, it's not. And I don't say that to shock you. I don't say that to tell you things that are just depressing and unfortunately uncomfortable to hear. I tell you that because I want to motivate you. I want you to consider that there are things going on in this world that we should be objecting to, that we should be fighting. Amy Carmichael literally took on at the turn of the century when women had no rights, by herself, she took on the normal religious organization of that country which India is still primarily Hindu. She took on the Indian government. She took on her own missions board. And she single-handedly refused to accept what was known as normal. She refused to consider that just because that's the way it was, that's the way it's going to be. Proverbs 3.27 it says, do not withhold good from those whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. As I said, the Amy Donover Fellowship still serves India today. Human trafficking has grown immensely since Amy's time. 
And in fact, just because of Amy's objection to it, the use of children in the Hindu temple as prostitutes was legal up until the 1950s. And because of her objections and because of her fighting, it became illegal in the 50s. Now that is not to mean it stopped. It just means that it went under the blanket and people look and nod and look the other way. So in a hundred years, Amy Carmichael hasn't done a lot. In fact, some would say she failed. But I would argue that girls like Prina would say differently. What she did was she changed the world for Prina and for thousands of youngsters in India ever since. When I look at Wings of Refuge, who I serve, there are a lot of women who come to us broken that the world would tell you they're lost. They're beyond hope. There's nothing left in them. They're completely used up and destroyed. And from a world perspective, they're not inaccurate. But from God's perspective, there is a child of God that both deserves to be respected and loved and redeemed. We as Christians are called. Matthew is clear. It is our obligation to see people in need and to work with those people, to do what we can to change that world. My friends, the days you live in are evil. And it's not normal for a Christian to kind of insulate and isolate themselves from the ugliness of the world. When I share about human trafficking, I find a lot of people gasping and go, shaking their head and going, no, that can't be real. Because I don't want it to be real. But the sad truth is, to insulate ourselves and isolate ourselves from the painful of world is not what God called us to do. And it is, in fact, violating the very thing that God calls us to do. Matthew 5, 13 through 16 is very clear. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, or put on a stand that gives light out to the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven." For you to be overwhelmed by the world problems today is not a normal. And I will tell you, part of me looks at it and just shakes my head and says, it's too much. It cannot be done. When the Wings of Refuge started, and I've shared this with Bible study, the Wings of Refuge started from a group of women in a Bible study up in Iowa Falls in Ackley about 12 women to be exact. 12 rural Iowa women with no experience, no knowledge, no expertise in human trafficking. They watched a video and it moved their hearts and they said, what should we do? What can we do? We're just, nobody's in the middle of Iowa. How can we impact human trafficking? But they did what I would always suggest is a good thing to do to start. They prayed and said, Lord, what would you have us do? Now, there's a danger in praying something like that. And that is, in fact, if you ask God to show you what you need to do, be prepared to hear an answer. And be prepared that you may not be comfortable with that answer. What those women received, the answer was, you're to open a house for women escaping trafficking. And they're like, we have no experience with that. We have no funds. We have no knowledge. We have nothing. But they were very clear that that was what God said to them. Just as Amy Carmichael was very clear when Prina came into her place, this is wrong. I need to do something. 
When she did that, she violated every rule and regulation within the country. When Wings of Refuge started, they broke all the rules. You can't do things like that without knowing what you're doing. And I've heard some of the stories of the early days of how they worked through things and did things and they learned things quickly. It was a long process, but I will tell you that today Wings of Refuge has two houses in Ames. It's thriving, we are growing, we are serving women every day that are coming out of trafficking. And the expertise is such that the FBI has actually sought out our people to ask them advice on how to deal with women in trafficking. A group of women went from knowing nothing to having enough knowledge to advise the FBI. They went through a lot of work and a lot of training. And I will encourage any of you who are interested as one of the ways of doing what Matthew calls you to do is if you're inspired to do volunteer work, you will go through a, an extensive training program. In fact, it's a two-step program that you're gonna go through before you can even volunteer at Wings of Refuge because there's training that has to happen so we protect these women. It's not a by-the-book kind of organization, but it is very much an organization that we do things the way it should be done. It is a situation where what started out as being kind of a, we have no idea what we're doing, to an organization that's very well organized, that is very well run. Amy Carmichael, in the same way, started taking in kids in her institute, not knowing exactly what that would look like. But it turned out to be a ministry that still works today, and it will still touch people's lives. For you and me today, what does that mean, other than an inspiring story by Amy Carmichael? Amy Carmichael was not special. She came from rural Ireland, or, or yeah, and she did not have specific training. What she did have was a sense of right and wrong, a sense of injustice when she saw people in pain. I will tell you that that was not an accident. And I will tell you that each and every one of you is called to be a minister of God. You are called to do something. Whether it's one thing or another, I don't know what. And I'm not qualified to sit here and tell you what your job will be. But I am here to tell you that God has placed on your heart things that stir your heart. Things that upset you. I became a police officer because I saw people being victimized and I wanted to stop that. And I was an aggressive police officer. I arrested people very many times. I was a leading arrester in many, many situations. I met, I arrested so many people in the 70s and 80s for OWI that the Attorney General's office in Des Moines knew me by name. I was aggressive because God put a passion in my heart. Now, did I solve crime in Iowa? No, it still continues. But did God give me a desire to look after those folks who have a deal? They cannot do it for themselves. It's no accident that I ended up at Wings of Refuge. Their ministry speaks exactly to the calling that God has put on my heart to minister to those who are being taken advantage of, to people who have been abused and taken. I'm here to tell you that each and every one of you has a calling on your life. And how you know what that calling is, is know what creates passion in your heart. What do you see 
that brings fire into your blood. When you see this, you go, that is wrong. That is wrong. Somebody should do something. There's an old joke that there was a man praying and says, God, look at this world. It's a mess. People are killing each other. People are starving. People are dying. People are not loving each other. You should do something. And God's answer was, I did. I made you. My friends, you have a calling on your life. You may not feel qualified to change the world. I can assure you that Amy Carmichael did not feel qualified to change the world. And a hundred years after her life, barely anybody even knows who she was. So it's arguable. The gals that started Wings of Refuge certainly had no idea, but they had a passion. They felt a calling from God that says something should not go on like this without somebody doing something. Amy Carmichael's own words, this is upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, another's life, another's death, I stake my whole eternity. Amy Carmichael is giving you a very much personal revision of Matthew that we read that says, I saw you hungry and I fed you. I saw you in prison and I visited you. Amy desired to do something about the pain she saw in her world. She ministered to the least of those around her and she took on a lot of static and a lot of problems. Amy Carmichael actually stayed in India and died doing the service. And I suspect because of the fact that she was in conflict with the Indian government, she knew if she'd ever taken a furlough and went back to Ireland, that India would never let her back in because they didn't like her very much. She busted the system a little too much. So Amy Carmichael served up until 1950, and I can't remember the day that she died, but she, was, she served 55 years in India without one single furlough because there were kids that needed her. There were people who needed to have salvation shown to them. You and I are Christians who are called to minister to one another. Your ministry may look different than somebody else's. You may be financially supporting a group or an organization. You may be doing other work, volunteering. And like I said, I would encourage you to find groups that you can volunteer at. It may be financially. It may be prayerfully. I'm going to leave here and go to a nursing home and preach this same sermon. And for people who are in a nursing home, to tell them that they have work to do may seem a little bit laughable because they are in a care facility having people take care of them. But what I'm going to tell you is that they have a mission available to them that you also have. It's called the mission of prayer. God's work does not get done without his people praying. We cannot operate. I don't get up here and preach without somebody praying for me. Trust me, this is not me on my own. I'm not this good. But I will tell you that somebody praying for you can make a big difference. We are, in fact, called to be active in our world. And if you're any question about that, I'm going to read James 2, 14 through 20. This is what good is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith and does not have works? Can your faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things they needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say to you, I have, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. 
Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that for faith apart from works is useless? James is very clear. Now, he is not suggesting that your works will get you to heaven. But he is suggesting that if I am a Christian, if I have been saved, if I have received the Holy Spirit as a Christian is supposed to have, that that Holy Spirit is going to move me, speak to me, and show me people that need help. And that I, as a Christian, am then supposed to do what I am called to do. And if I fail to do that, James suggests, just as Jesus did in Matthew, that perhaps you really aren't as close to God as you say you are. If you can look at the world today and see all the problems and all the losses and all the suffering that's going on, and not feel something, then my friends, I suggest you go to the Bible and say, Lord, do I really know you? Because I don't think a Christian can look at this world today without having some kind of pain, without having something move within them that suggests to them, there is a reason for you to be here today. I have a calling on your world. Now, like I said, as a pastor, I can preach this message to you, but I cannot tell you what your calling is. I'll be more than happy to go through it with you and see if we can figure it out together. Because I firmly believe there's not a single soul on this world that is saved that does not have a calling on their life. That there is something you are supposed to be doing. That there is some way you're supposed to be ministering to the fellow man around you. And if that's the case, then James and Matthew, through Jesus, tells me, I better be looking for what it is that I'm supposed to be doing. I can honestly tell you that I've been a Christian for far too many years. And when I look at what I've done for Christ over those years, Way more time has been spent worrying about my worldly job, worrying about my worldly problems, worrying about all sorts of other things, and not enough time spent saying, God, what should I be doing for someone else? Now, I can't go back and change the past, but I can change today. I can change tomorrow. And I suggest to you that God is calling you to do something today and tomorrow. The question I leave you with is, will you listen? Will you do it? Thank you.